Our first reading today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not hold even your shirt. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Imagine you'd never met me. I walk up to you and I ask if I can borrow $50. How do you think you would respond? Now, imagine you have known me for a little while and you've discovered that I buy lotto tickets and make bets at the local TAB. I ask if I can borrow $50. How do you respond? Imagine you've known me for quite some time. I work hard and if I'm asked to help with something, I generally say yes and do what I say I will. I ask if I can borrow $50. How do you respond? The truth is that most of us will say no to the first two scenarios without giving much thought to it. Someone I've never met or someone I know can't be trusted with money is unlikely to get my direct financial help. I might provide some food or similar, but I'm unlikely to hand over cash. On the other hand, Someone who has built up relationship over time, who's provide, proved themselves trustworthy and reliable, that may be a different story. The difference is that in the third example, I've done what is sometimes called putting money in the bank. I've behaved in ways that mean you are likely to trust me and support me. Let me give you an example in my role here as minister. Over the last three years, I've to the best of my ability, try to produce a reliable, for the most part, if I can believe what you tell me, enjoyable Sunday service. You trust that if you turn up on Sunday, you'll get something that is reasonably predictable, scratches the right spots, and leaves you feeling good for the rest of the week. If I was to turn up next week and be completely offbeat and weird, you would give me the benefit of the doubt. He's just having an off day. Because you trust that in general, my behaviour is sound. I may not do everything you like, but it's good enough. I've put money in the bank. If I need to make a withdrawal for some reason, perhaps I think we need to change some things around, I can make the change and you'll allow it. Maybe grumble a bit, but allow it because I've done what you've needed the rest of the time. It's true that some dishonest people use this process for their own benefit, we read of scams all the time when lonely people have given money to people who they think have taken an interest in them. We do need to be careful about who we trust. But the idea of building up credit or money in the bank has real benefits as well as downsides. I don't imagine any of this is news to you. It's simply an aspect of human nature. The problem with our reading this morning is that Jesus takes it a step beyond where most of us are comfortable. Jesus is saying that you don't get any credit for being nice to your friends. You're not putting anything in the bank of God by loving people who love you back or helping people who will help you in response. 
God's credit comes when you help the people who will lie and cheat and steal from you, who will take all the help you can give them and walk away without looking back, who will speak horribly of you to their friends, who will eat your food and then spit in your face. And let me tell you right now that there are plenty of people in the world who are like that. Some of them because they don't know any better. Others because that is what they choose. And Jesus says, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. I suspect that one of the reasons the church is struggling as it is, is because we've lost sight of this key principle. And so the credit that could be building up in the bank of God is run out, and we are left with empty pockets. What do you think? Our second reading follows on from the first, Luke chapter 6, verses 37 to 38. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. I want to make it clear that I'm not in any way disparaging the church, what it has been, what it is now. Have we made some mistakes along the way? Of course we have. Could we have done better? Of course we could. That's simply not the point. The point I'm trying to make here is that we are here and now. And here and now is always a good time to evaluate and move on. Philosopher George Santayana once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. I think it could equally be said that those who do not see the future approaching are condemned to be crushed beneath it. It's not as good as George's quote, but feel free to use it. Let's celebrate our past. Those things good and bad that have brought us here. Then, without pause, look to what is ahead of us and celebrate the fact that in God, we are always becoming more like Jesus. Then we decide what that means in our words and actions. I find it interesting that Jesus immediately follows the idea of loving our enemies with these words, do not judge, do not condemn, forgive and give. All of these appeared with a response. Keep the idea of loving our enemies in mind as we go through these. Do not judge and you will not be judged. This is not about sitting in judgment over criminal actions. It's about how we treat other people around us with love and humility. Are they too heavy or too thin or too slow or too short or too tall or too pretty or not pretty enough? Do they wash the dishes wrong, use incorrect grammar, turn up late, forget things? The list is endless. I suspect we're all guilty of judging others in this way. In a way, Ms. Adern speaks to the church without realising it when she reminds us to be kind. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned simply reinforces this thinking. Forgiveness and generosity call us to a different way of thinking and being. When we are forgiving and generous, judging and condemnation become unimportant and fade into the background. Equally, when we fail to forgive and to give, it's easy to see judgment and condemnation slipping back into our behaviour. Can you see how this applies to our loving our enemies? It is in the end a difference of heart. Show me a person blaming the poor for their circumstances, and I will show you someone who's lost the arts of generosity and forgiveness. Show me a person whose first response to anything they don't like is to complain, and I will show you someone whose heart has become mired in judgment and condemnation. How many of you remember that song, Pressed Down, Shaken Together, Running Out All Over? 
God wants us to experience that joyful, messy experience of receiving back in abundance the measure of generosity and forgiveness we display for others. Those we love and our enemies. Those we trust and those we trust as far as we can throw them. It's not clean and easy. It doesn't come with a tidy cover and a nice little bow. This kind of generosity and forgiveness is what builds credit in the bank of God. And it pays back many times over. Can I invite you to invest in that bank? In doing so, I think we remember the past and invite the future with hope and faith. That seems pretty exciting to me. We pray. God of regular, everyday people, normal people with hopes and dreams, mistakes and failures, help us to live not in fear of what tomorrow may bring, but in faith that you hold the future in your hand. Gift us the ability to forgive and give with joy and in abundance. We know that it will be messy. We know that it will be uncomfortable. We know that you will celebrate with us in that mess and discomfort. Teach us to be lovers of this world and all the people in it, even the ones we don't like. Through the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.